بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم گڈ مارننگ اینڈ شنین کوائلا چائنیز نیو ایئر آف دا ڈریگن سو وی ہیو سم فرینڈس فرام چائنا آن لائن اینڈ مس تبسم از ہیئر فرام دا چائنا میڈیا گروپ اینڈ وی آلسو ہیو میڈم ہانگ یو ہو از سینئر ڈائریکٹر آف دا گرین اویشن ہب فرام بیجنگ Thank you for joining. We have Christoph Nedefil, uh, our co-founder of the Green CPEC Alliance, who is situated as of now in Australia, and he's a global nomad. So uh, good to see you, sir. And then we have uh, other friends uh, online as well. I'm very grateful that this morning, uh, a lot of people have taken their time to come here. And we have a representative from the German embassy, Welcome, sir. Former uh, ambassador of Pakistan to China, uh, Ambassador Masood Khalid Saab, who was there actually. And actually, we'll seek your guidance because we are talking about phase two and the green transition. Uh, and you were there when we were doing the early harvest projects were being conceived. And then we are very grateful for uh, <clears throat> the uh, senior representative, uh, Honorable Brigadier Saab from IPRI, Thank you, sir, for coming. <clears throat> and then many other colleagues, Gilani Saab has come from Peshawar. And uh, this is a joint initiative of uh, Peace Pakistan China Institute, SDPI. Mr. Obaid is there right now and his other colleague will come. And Christoph Nedofil, uh, who was at that time at the Fudan University. And Zameer Awan Saab is here. So very, very grateful to everyone for coming at this very important uh, Uh, initiative and Shazia Ghani Saiba is here, I see. Hmm. Actually, this uh, dialogue is part of the discourse that we have been uh, having and uh, Pakistan China Institute, SDPI and Christoph have been hosting these dialogues and we have been writing on this of how can we in a practical, bankable profitable manner move towards this green transition in the China-Pakistan economic corridor. Uh, we have uh, two key events that actually put into context also today's meeting. One is uh, the third Belt and Road Forum, which took place in Beijing in October, and in which President Xi Jinping gave very clear and categorical guidelines and uh, 
outlined his vision for the GIFT, uh, which is the abbreviation, uh, and which is actually uh, the, I would say, the Chinese version of the just transition, which is a more Western concept. But the GIFT is a more investment-based approach in global South countries in green projects. And President Xi Jinping actually announced $100 billion uh, to be invested in renewable and green projects in Belt and Road countries. Mm. And then we uh, saw that the COP28 took place and China was very well represented there, Pakistan was there. And this discussion was held there as well. The challenge that we saw and we face, and which is why we are here today, is to actually develop a framework. And we have partners from China who will also work with us in this in the future, particularly uh, Christoph and Hong Yu and all of you people who are who give the Beijing perspective and how you have actually done uh, that in uh, in China of how we can transition these fossil fuel projects in a bankable, profitable way, which is actually uh, investment friendly, uh, which is actually something that can have a good tariff, which is, you know, something that investors have an incentive to pursue, not only out of compassion of climate change or uh, green development, and we have data, and I think Christoph will also share some of the data, and we have a lot of data, and I've also written about this, and actually Christoph and I have co-authored some of the some reports uh, in the past as well, that show that renewable investments <clears throat> are actually uh, internationally, they employ more, they give more employment uh, opportunities compared to fossil fuel projects. And also, if the regulatory environment is up to date, it, it is also uh, more profitable from a business perspective. <clears throat> but in Pakistan, we have many variables. We have seen that the influx of investment has been in power, but uh, not in parallel with the grid infrastructure. And as we know that we need smart grids, updated grids, to absorb renewable energy investments. And also, I think another very important issue is, and uh, I think we should also submit the report that of our findings to the regulator, to NEPRA. And Zuberi Saab, very grateful, sir, you're here, from the China Three Gorges, senior advisor of the China Three Gorges Corporation, which is a very big investor of at least $5 billion in Pakistan, uh, five to $6 billion uh, cumulatively. And ongoing, yeah. uh, I hope. <laughs> so we see that a lot of the ch companies, there's a disconnect between the regulator, the tariffs that are awarded, and the expected tariff that investors are looking for. <clears throat> so I think we need to acclimatize the regulators. Uh, and of course, banks have a very key role. We have a friend from... Uh, HBL, who handles the China coverage uh, of Pakistan and external uh, uh, markets. HBL is the largest uh, Pakistani bank that is involved in uh, CPEC and has uh, branches in Urumqi, in Beijing, etc. And has actually equity also, I think, in some of the CPEC projects. So, acclimatizing the regulator to give those tariffs for those renewable energy investments. Because if we talk about what we are talking about, but at the end of the day, the tariffs for fossil fuel investments are more attractive than renewable energy investments, uh, then, then, there's, then there's a disconnect. And I think that disconnect needs to be bridged. So, uh, and I think there has to be some uh, more exposure of the regulators to international, uh, uh, you know, criteria and decision making on tariff award, uh, tariff awarding. 
I think that also needs to be done from what we've seen because uh, it's a very closed infrastructure. It's uh, it ha and you know they they of course uh, very well equipped, but sometimes we see that the needs of today's uh, circumstances are not being met by the regulator and it's an autonomous body. So I think this is also a very important point that we need to address. Um, of course, we will also be joined by Mr. Shah Jahan Mirza Saab, who has uh, actually been at the forefront of the CPEC power projects, the particularly the early harvest projects. The power private power infra infrastructure board takes the lead on that, and he will be joining us shortly as well. So the point of this discussion is to have a very candid conversation, to come up with some solutions, to come up with some uh, ideas that we can take forward, and you know go beyond the surface. We need to scratch the surface and move forward. And then also, we plan to. <clears throat> submit this to the new government which will come, uh, particularly the Ministry of Energy, the, the Prime Minister's office. And uh, this is also very, very important because uh, Pakistan also needs to have a lot of clarity on its uh, future energy landscape. So I think that is also uh, something which is really important objective for us so this is just the context that I wanted to put in place before we kick off the conversation. And has Arvia joined us, by the way? Is Arvia there? Okay. Uh, we are Arvia from uh, the Regenerative Society. Uh, based in Bonn, will also join us. And she is a Belt and Road uh, practitioner and expert, pretty, and you, works very closely with the UN, UN uh, Triple C, uh, and has been engaging with China in a for a very long time. And also, uh, part of her ecosystem is a very key company in Kenya, which has set up a very sustainable project. Uh, of uh, livestock and agriculture. And we would like to hear from her, but I think she's not joined. So over to uh, uh, Mr. Zuberi, the senior advisor of the China Three Gorges Corporation. Uh, one thing that I would request is that uh, if we can keep the comments, the interventions till six minutes. And after that, I will very politely flag you to uh, kind of pause and then that can be continued in the question hour session because I, the uh, interactive session is very, very, I think more important than uh, this and getting feedback. So uh, over to you, please be mindful of the time. Thank you, Mustafa Saab, for a very comprehensive overview. And we are very grateful to Pakistan China Institute for this event, which is a very important event, energy transition. It has been talked at China. It has been talked in the third Belt and Road Forum. It has been talked at COP28. So it is, I think, the first event which is taking place in Pakistan on this specific subject of green energy transition. So let me give you a brief presentation, if you allow me. Please, next, please. Because there are only six minutes, I will be a bit fast. <laughs> Next, please. <laughs> now, most important thing is that Pakistan has a tremendous renewable energy potential. Wind potential is 346,000 megawatts. Solar potential is 2.9 million megawatts. And hydro potential is around 60,000 megawatts. Next, please. Now, if you see the total power generation in Pakistan has an installed capacity of nearly 41,000. Out of this, 60% is in private sector, which means that private sector is playing a dominant role in Pakistan power sector. Next, please. 
Now, if you see that this is just a map which indicates that 1835 megawatts of IPPs are based on wind, 630 megawatts are on solar, and four IPPs of 1,500 megawatts are on hydros. Next, please. This is a portfolio of the CPEC projects. These are the projects which are in operation. In total, there are 11 projects which are in operation with a capacity of about 6,000 megawatts. From this slide, you can see that the green uh, uh, part of this indicates renewable energy projects. So it clearly indicates that under CPEC, there are a lot many renewable energy projects which have been commissioned. So it is a misperception that CPEC is always talks about the fossil fuels or imported fuel. So that you can see in the next, which are the in the next uh, phase of the projects which are under development, there are eleven projects of seven thousand megawatts, and you see a lot of renewable energy projects in that second. Uh, I just received a message from uh, Christoph that the slides are not moving, and we are still on the first slide for the people on Zoom. So I request IT to make sure that the Zoom participants are in sync with the real time happening here, particularly the PowerPoint. Next, please. So the hiccup is all over. The other people can see the slides. Okay. So about 22,000 megawatts of uh, basically, uh, I will not say only renewable because there is a local coal also. Projects based on indigenous, indigenous fuels are coming up in the next, uh, basically, by 2031. This is data is according to the IGCEP 2022. And this IGCEP was prepared by NTDC as then made approved by the uh, NAPRA on February 1st, 2023. Next, please. Now, if you see this is an energy mix in 2022, the capacity is around 41,000 megawatts. In, in 2031, it is 68667 megawatts. So in 2031, it will be dominant by the renewable energy projects. Next, please. I'll have to move a bit fast because <laughs> you have given me only six minutes. So if you see and that- sir, One re request is yes. that I would like uh, also that in uh, apart from the work that CTG is doing, how CTG can perhaps, because you have been a pioneer in even CPEC, sure, sure. the road started much before CPEC. So how you can be a pioneer in this green transition? I, will, uh, my, I have few slides on this. I have few slides. Don't worry. Now, in renewable energy transition, if you see that renewable energy share in year 2023 was 31%. And in year 30, 2031, it will be a 62%. So if you see presently, there is about uh, solar is 2%, wind is 4%, and hydro is 24%. Whereas in year 2031, it will be, solar will be 19% in, in, uh, in our uh, energy transition, and wind will be around 10%, and hydros will be around 33%. Next, please. Now, this is a summary of the CPEC projects. If you see the solar and wind projects, 69, 699 megawatts of solar projects are already in operations. 700 project megawatts of projects will be coming up. So in total, there will be 1399 megawatts of solar and wind projects. For hydro, there will be total 3428 megawatts of projects. For coal, 4620 megawatts of projects are already in operation and 3,600 megawatts are in the development stage. So for coal, there are total 8,220 megawatts of coal-fired power projects. Next, please. Now, for coal, let me first of all touch upon the coal. Now, for the coal power projects, we will be talking of the retirement of the coal-based projects, these CPEC projects. 
Now for coal based projects, one should be very clear that these projects are being developed under government of Pakistan power policy 2015. The companies have signed long-term agreements with the government of Pakistan and with CPPAG. The lenders are basically China Exim mostly and China Development and ICBC. And they have provided long-term financing for 10 to 12 years. The projects are based on supercritical technology, so they are environmentally clean projects. Projects have recently been commissioned and people are learning in Pakistan, people are learning about the coal technology and issues related to the coal projects because all our indigenous resources, which includes coal, so there is a uh, tremendous potential at Thar. So we have to develop that potential also. So learning is important. So organizations in Pakistan are in a learning mode at the moment. Coal projects are run in Pakistan as a base load projects, which are needed in the system to supplement the renewable energy based projects, which are wind and solar. Government of Pakistan, this is very, very important. If we try to retire these projects, then government will have to pay severe penalties. We have to pay for five years lost profits. This is according to documents which we have signed. Next, please. Next, please. Next, please, yeah. Next slide. Yes. Now, third Belt and Road Forum and COP28 stressed the crucial role of energy transition to address climate change. This can be achieved through early retirement of coal projects, tripling renewable energy projects, and doubling efficiency. Early retirement of coal projects under CPEC involves huge cost, financing of which may be tapped from just energy transition program, Asian Development Bank energy transition program, and China Green Innovation Financing. The coal projects in Pakistan, as I have earlier told, has been established as an IPP. They have signed long-term agreements based on latest technologies, and have, these have been commissioned very recently. Next, please. Nice slide, Queen. Yes. Now, if the financing is available from various multinational institutions, which they are willing to finance for the renewable projects, then the financing could be diverted to convert existing imported coal projects on the basically local coal, number one. Number two, in the improvement of NTDC system. Earlier, Indonesia took an initiative of retiring their some coal-fired power projects. They tried, went to, for financing, but they could not get the financing. So this plan was shelved. Pakistan economy is not in good conditions at that point in time and has barely prevented default. The power sector is loaded with problems suffering with high circular debt. So early retirement of the coal projects in Pakistan under CPEC be a bit a difficult proposition at this point in time. Next, please. Now, to encourage projects based on solar and wind, government of Pakistan, first of all, has prepared maps, solar map and wind map, so that I, Investors should know where the solar projects and wind power projects should be located. Government has announced Renewable Energy Policy 2019. It provides lucrative incentives to the private sector investors. PPIB is acting as a one window facility. There are standard documents. There is only this power to business which provides government of Pakistan's sovereign guarantees. So lucrative incentives are already there. Next, please. There is also a fast track initiative of the solar power projects. Under that utility scale, high, uh, solar power, please. Okay. 
utility scale projects will be around 6,000 megawatts, solar PV generation will be around 2,000 megawatts, and solarization of the public buildings will be around 1,000 megawatts. Next, please. <clears throat> now, there are certain challenges for the development of renewable energy projects. Before embarking on the new projects, let's resolve the problems of the existing investors and the existing problems which investors are are facing. First, there is a frequent change in the policy and this discourages private sector investors. Recently, some renegotiations of the tariff was carried out for wind power projects which discourage the investors. There is a great problem. There is an insufficient transmission line, concerns about the grid station, you know, the existing projects, in existing projects, there is a power curtailment issue. So first of all, the transmission line system should be strengthened. Land acquisition is an also issue. I will not go into details. There is an issue of the delays in the payments from CPPG, delay in the conversion of Pakistan. Next, please. PKR to dollars. There is an issue of the limited access to the local financing that is extremely expensive, local financing. We are a banker, <laughs> so it is difficult. There is a limited international availability of the international financing. Next, please. I will limit time. Now, the strategy. What should be the strategy? The strategy should be that we should encourage collaboration between the government departments and Chinese private investors through private public sector participation, sharing the risk responsibility and to attract private financing. Next is develop and implement risk mitigation mechanism to address uncertainties in the policy, technology, and power purchase. Explore insurance products, which are there. Work collaboratively with utilities to enhance grid, in, that grid in, uh, infrastructure needs to be enhanced. Next, local financing. Facilitate the establishment of the local financing options Favorable terms and conditions should be negotiated. International financing and partnership should be there. Most important thing, this. Now I will be stressing on this. This is very important. Government should create a renewable energy fund. The multinational should provide that fund. And that fund should be catalytic. You know, there is already policy. Investors are not coming up. So some additional sweetener should be there. Earlier in 1994, when IPPs were not coming up, Government created such type of fund, PSADF funds, and this loan is supplemented. So if at least 30 to 40% is financing, financing is provided through this fund, then other lenders will definitely come. Such financing, this fund could be uh, uh, basically created with the support of the government of China, the banks in China, and other multinationals, because renewable funding is available, and on government guarantee, it can be easily obtained. So the conclusion now. So I think I've not run up trying. Please, next please. Next please. Now Chinese investors basically have a lot of success stories in the developing renewable projects under CPEC in Pakistan. Multiple sources of financing, local, international, multilateral, and bilateral financing be explored for the development of renewable energy projects. And about the early retirement of the CPEC coal-fired power projects, what I will say is that it should be carefully studied first by studying its all pros and cons. And then we should embark on this initiative. Thank you very much. I think I am within the limit. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think your point of the Renewable Energy Fund is very interesting. I would, since we have banks here also, and I think we've had a conversation about this, and Ms. Shadia Ghani is here, and she actually has given such suggestions in the past. I think the state bank also needs to step up its game, and uh, China actually has very good green bonds and panda bonds, uh, which are uh, green financial products, which we so far have not seen any work on, or if there has been work, there has been not enough visibility. Uh, I think that is uh, something that would also encourage uh, uh, Chinese uh, financial companies to look at the Pakistan market. So it's not only uh, hardware projects of brick and mortar. It doesn't always have to be a road or a power plant. 
but they the today's world is actually moving towards uh, uh you know uh, financial products and investments via finance, uh, financial products with companies investing in them and stocks and futures. So I think the state bank should also uh, perhaps uh, review its uh, uh, engagement with the China Exim Bank, China Development Bank. And I think uh, it can be, there can be more partnership on this. And I think that would also encourage investment in in, in this green realm. Uh, now I'd like to ask Mr. Umar Khan, who is the head of investment banking uh, of Bank of Punjab, to give his two cents. Sure. Thank you very much, Mr. Fasad. Uh, Assalamu alaikum and good morning to all of you. Uh, can I have the sharing rights, please? I would like to put up Chris' three slides. Yes, I think I can. Uh, and sorry, I think in the last presentation of the Barisa, which was very interesting, the slides were not moving. So if they do not move even now, kindly please uh, somebody speak up and let me know. Yes, slides wala shumala issue jo hai na, dara, please dekh le, kyunke... Inki bini move karinti. Make sure. Uh, I would request agar zoom pe, if on zoom the slides are not moving, please tell us. You can uh, write it in the chat box or just message me directly. So is the first slide visible to everyone? Yes. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I just have three crisp slides and uh, I would like to, because you know we are on the clock, so I would like to uh, you know, be very calculated here uh, and would not repeat some of the things that Zubairi Saab has very uh, clearly mentioned. So being a financier and representative of commercial banks, uh, I think it's important to have perspective of uh, large local commercial banks uh, who have been part of CPEC projects. I would like to restrict myself primarily to two, to two areas. One about the financing measures uh, that can be utilized and specific interventions on the renewable energy side, capacity additions on the renewable energy side. And the second, I would briefly touch upon uh, the efficacy and the use case uh, for these two mechanisms like energy transition mechanisms and JETPs and what is their applicability in the context of Pakistan. Um, I am on the second slide on the left side. I hope it's visible to everyone. On the financing measures, there are concessional funding available, and we are talking about hard currency financing. As a financier, I think uh, the, the single biggest challenge that any of these projects, any large infrastructure project, specifically renewable energy projects would face is the availability of hard currency funding. Um, so there's no shortage of uh, funding per se, but I think it's important because the Barisa also mentioned about the cost of that funding. So institutions like the, like the Green Climate Fund, and there are certain other international DFIs which offer concessional fund funding specifically for green interventions and for renewable energy projects. And these fundings are available at a project-wide level, as well as these, uh, this funding line can also be provided to domestic Pakistani banks and financial institutions who can then use this concessional funding to online uh, the requisite amount of foreign currency to qualifying projects. Uh, so these are two methods available. We need to sort of take use of it, make use of it. Uh, risk guarantees are also on offer. So certain domestic financial institutions uh, who are full up in terms of their credit appetite, uh, they can benefit from, from such products uh, and, and basically increase their exposure further on the renewable energy space. Co-financings, which is basically joint financings by international DFIs and domestic commercial financial institutions, who each take care of the respective leg of the transaction, which means that international DFIs like the IFCs, Proparcos, FMOs, ADBs, they take care of the foreign currency requirement, uh, and the local currency piece can be taken on by the local commercial banks and FIs. Uh, the second one is, is the second intervention is, is specifically tailored to domestic banks. Uh, we generally respond very well as an industry, the domestic commercial banks, to directed lending. So we have experimented with this in other industries also. So what we are suggesting is that mandatory targets need to be introduced in a stepped up or in a phased manner for domestic commercial banks and EFIs by the central bank. Uh, if the incentive has to be sweetened further, then certain tax breaks can also be introduced uh, on income generated on by these banks on refinancing, so thereby further incentivizing. 
and obviously a carrot and stick approach uh, can also be adopted where penalties can also be imposed on commercial banks who fail to meet these mandatory targets. Uh, Zubairi Saab and Mustafa Saab, you also spoke about using uh, newer financing instruments. So absolutely, we need to tap all the funding pots available, especially for hard currency. Uh, so green bonds, there's a lot of appetite amongst international investors for green bonds. Uh, you also mentioned, and you were right, that there have been very few interventions in Pakistan. WAPTA's 500 million euro bond is one example. Uh, but I think there have not been any other notable international level interventions uh, insofar as Pakistani enterprises are concerned. So yes, that's a focus, should be a focus area. You also mentioned Panda bonds, which I think is a very, very important source of funding, especially because increasingly, almost exclusively, all of our equipment and contracting is being done by Chinese enterprises. So I think it makes a lot of sense that Chinese commercial investors, so this is basically uh, uh, Chinese local currency funding. And, and I think it's important that Pakistani enterprises and companies take benefit of the Chinese domestic local currency funding, which is available. <clears throat> there has been a lot of talk about voluntary carbon markets and carbon credits and carbon trading. I think that is an area where we lack far behind. Uh, uh, Zubairi Saab also spoke, and I think in the, in the similar vein, it's a similar idea that we need to look at. Uh, PPIB is there as a one window facilitator, that's right. But we are talking more on the likes of, we had some fantastic erstwhile institutions like the NDFCs and IDBPs and Bankers Equity, which back in the 70s and 80s did some fantastic work in terms of developing infrastructure in Pakistan. So on the similar lines, what we are suggesting is a green infrastructure fund or a green infrastructure bank that should have the exclusivity of mandate. It should have dedicated expertise also, and very importantly, a large funding base because so that it can spearhead, and as Zubairi Saab was mentioning, so that it can channelize and help other co-investors and domestic banks and other institutions to sort of partner with them. Very importantly, it will help the, on the economies of a scale side. And this is a point that I will touch upon later also because uh, typically on the renewable energy side, frankly, the interventions have been very, very small. So even when you talk about the likes of IFCs and other multilaterals, they typically look at anywhere between 20 to 50 megawatt per project. Now, these institutions, with all due respect, are great, but uh, they take a lot of time. Project development takes a lot of time. I think it's important that we need to increase the size of the intervention, which means that as opposed to 50 or 20 or 30 megawatts, this needs to be done on a mass scale. So we need to be looking at project sizes of 200, 250 megawatts at least so that uh, you know it's a meaningful contribution for the time that will be required. Collaboration is very important uh, and not just on the brick and mortar side, as you rightly said, Mustafa Saab, I think it's important that Chinese and Pakistani commercial banks and FIs, uh, we need to be more in touch through formal forums because in our interactions with them uh, on various forums, we find there's a lot of understanding gap and misconceived notions uh, in terms of, uh, especially revolving around the foreign currency regime in Pakistan. And it's sort of a black box, whereas it shouldn't be the case. Uh, State Bank is very, very clear in terms of how the equity has to be come in. And we often find ourselves stuck with certain Chinese enterprises who bring their equity investment in without proper registration, and then they face issues and repatriation of that money. So, so that people-to-people -people contact, especially on the financial institution side, is critical, I think, in terms of removing some of these misconceptions and then improving upon some of the processes where the improvement requirement lies. Uh, you know, we need to deepen up our capital markets for bonds and equities domestically. Uh, the derivative market has to be developed, uh, you know, so that we can further incentivize this. Um, this this was on the financing side very briefly uh, you know the elephant in the room Zubairi Saab also mentioned I think there have to be very visible confidence building measures for existing sponsors and developers of projects which find themselves uh, you know issues especially with respect to outstanding receivables what is very important is there has to be a very visible follow through in terms of those issues being resolved for that necessary confidence to be going because. Really, you know, with those guys stuck, we really can't be asking them for any more money in terms of uh, further investment on the renewable side. Uh, efforts should be made towards increasing electricity demand. I think it's a double whammy right now that we are facing as a country. I think government, uh, the idea was right a couple of years ago where they incentivized additional uh, 
uh, usage of electricity because it, it helps reduce the capacity charges per unit. Uh, and I think it's important. Uh, grid enhancements has already been spoken about. I'll skip it. Uh, I think uh, this is also not a new idea, but very important that technology transfer, especially on the solar panel side and inverter side is something that we need to be looking at maybe over a five to seven year period because it will help conserve eventually the much needed foreign currency. Real-time data availability uh, across different verticals in the energy chain is important for important decision-making. It will also give a lot of confidence to investors and will further help attract investment there. Very briefly, uh, you know, our take on ETMs and just energy transition partnerships, um, I, I would basically second what, what Zubairi Saab has said that you know, on-ground realities represent that these represent some of the most efficient plants that Pakistan has right now. Uh, and also, as he very rightly mentioned, uh, you know, we are under strong concessions and it is very difficult to just break away uh, these arrangements right now and we will have a stranded assets. What we are also suggesting, just like Zubaris have suggested, is that we need to be looking at their immediate conversion uh, to third coal because that will immediately result uh, in in savings of about 25 to 30 percent and maybe more. Uh, so the idea is that we should pr probably let them run their remaining useful life, otherwise they will become a, a, a stranded asset. But we should reduce the pain uh, and reduce our dependence on the volatility in the international coal price market by converting them to third coal. Um, and probably, yes, I think no more capacity additions uh, on the coal side. In any event, our stock of coal projects as a percentage of our total generation capacity is not very large. Uh, we are about 7 gigawatts. Uh, you know, Vietnam is 37, India is 207. So, uh, I mean, we are bad, but there are worse out there, right? Um, also, I think in terms of these interventions, our suggestion is that these interventions probably need to be targeted towards our furnace oil projects, which are towards the end of their concession life. They are not being dispatched also. So I think so these ETMs and JETMs probably are more suited in Pakistan's case for conversion of these oil-based projects. So what are we essentially saying? This is my last slide. Uh, so what we are saying is, uh, we need to sort out issues of existing plant owners. Uh, on this is the last one in the coal phase out uh, that I'm talking about. Um, you know, their receivables should be cleared on priority, visible follow through, and in very importantly, in exchange for sort of helping those projects through, uh, the government can possibly uh, agree on, a, on an arrangement with those developers that they will help set up a minimum of 200 to 300 megawatt each of renewable energy projects at tariffs which are lower than the prevailing rates. Uh, we need to increase uh, the demand side, as I said, which will help reduce the burden of capacity charges. Uh, on the financing measures, again, um, I think what's also important, as I mentioned, the economies point, economies of a scale point earlier also, uh, we need to pull in our efforts. We need to increase the size of the interventions and as opposed to 50, 20 megawatt projects in one single go. For example, the government of Pakistan can enter into alliances or arrangements with each of the leading DFIs like ADB and IFC and Proparcos and FMOs and maybe develop a five-year program where each one of them is sort of tasked uh, to develop, let's say, 1,000 megawatts each over the next five years. So the idea is pulling enough resource resources and uh, you know sort of increasing capacities at a uh, larger Omar scale. Saab, uh, time uh, is uh, running out. 30 seconds. Last 30 seconds. This is the last point that I'm making. Thank you for this. Uh, very important. I think this is what we have also been advocating at a couple of other forums where we work together with the Chinese partners. Uh, I think the Chinese commercial lenders need to look at their commercial security that they take uh, when they project finance these assets because uh, some of the problems can be alleviated if you bring in local commercial banks here, but because they effectively do not leave any security available from the project assets for local commercial lenders, thereby, you know, it basically does not allow local banks to come in, step in and provide local currency financing, which would help some of the cash flow issues that some of these large Chinese coal projects are taking. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Amar Saab. Uh, I think these are some good points. And I think that banks here, like Bank of Punjab, like HBL and other banks, I think need to uh, engage more on this in this area. I think there's not enough engagement from banks and their perspectives and how they can uh, uh, contribute. And of course, and then working with State Bank, as we discussed earlier. Uh, particularly, I think green products, uh, I think will be a very good opportunity for Pakistan because China is way ahead in it already. And I think they'd be very happy to share their experience and share how we can cooperate if we show initiative in this regard. Uh, I would now like to ask uh, my dear friend, uh, Christoph Nedophil, who is uh, heading the Asia Center uh, in Australia to give his remarks. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Mustafa. What a pleasure to be here. And thanks so much for organizing and pulling together this event. <clears throat> Already um, really excellent presentations and uh, learning a lot. Um, I wish I could be there with you all in uh, Pakistan, but uh, sending my best wishes from Australia. Literally, I have kangaroos in uh, front of my um, window right now. We are uh, somewhere for a um, retreat with the company at the or with the university at the Gold Coast. So I hope to also visit have some visitors um, from Pakistan and around the world uh, here in beautiful Australia. Let me know when you want to come and we can arrange something. But now <clears throat> I think to the uh, big question of uh, accelerating SEEP greening the CPAC and it's been such a pleasure to kind of really spin out this idea together with Mustafa and PCI and uh, SDPI and others um, and to fill this even more with life and I think we're seeing really the green sprouts already um, kind of really coming out not only through guidelines but actually more and more through action. If I can share the screen, I will also be happy to kind of provide you some ideas of the research that Mustafa also just mentioned on um, the ability to finance early retirement of coal-fired power plants. And I'm really happy that this discussion is uh, so vibrant. I still cannot share the screen. If that's possible, um, then I can share my slides. Thank you. Okay, so <clears throat> I think one of the things kind of that we talk about is also, of course, for debt swaps, um, which is just one of the aspects that I will actually quickly touch upon. Um, we heard a little bit already kind of about this um, growing um, role of coal-fired power plants in Pakistan, and um, I think we also know that Pakistan is facing some sovereign debt distress risks. Um, and one of the drivers has been um, the coal imports um, that has have really um, taken, but well, the foreign currency uh, reserves of Pakistan have taken um, some serious hit. Um, and it also has led to a situation where Chinese companies invested in Pakistan's coal and do face a backlog of payments, a significant one. So there is a specific financial and economic risks already um, to current coal face uh, coal plant owners that I think is important to understand kind of what is the fair value um, if you want to write down coal fire power plants. Is it really the original value um, that was um, foreseen in the uh, kind of original contract and with a kind of cash flow um, evaluations? And then at present value calculations, is that still the fair evaluation? That's a question that I want to table, but I do want you to, to keep in the back of your head. And against this, I think it's really impressive to see kind of not only in um, Indonesia, but kind of really around the world, kind of this drive for coal-fired power plant retirement. Um, so that is touching both the, of course, the more developed countries in, in the European Union and the US and so on, but particularly also um, emerging economies and not just through um, development finance programs, but um, we saw and uh, kind of very bigly announced at um, COP, the re um, early retirement of ASIN, a coal-fired power plant in the Philippines, which was fully privately financed. So no 
um, no uh, kind of development finance institution was involved there. So that was really good. And I think there's also kind of just to remind ourselves, there's great new ideas for financial instruments um, supported also. And here um, we have kind of uh, Mr. Uh, Ravi Menon um, from the Monetary Authority of Singapore. So MAS is really supporting with new financial instruments, the early retirement of coal-fired power plant. And it's really important that from a financial innovation point of view, that um, we have A, the instruments, and B, a clear labeling of early retirement of coal um, plants um, as green finance. Um, so that is really um, possible now, particularly through the ASEAN taxonomy. It's a really good innovation going on there. Now, what does that mean, um, kind of particularly also for um, Pakistan? And here's really, I really uh, kind of, um, it, it might look complicated, but it's actually, of course, much more complicated in real life. So this is already the simple version um, of a refinancing mechanism. The idea of refinancing <clears throat> is that um, currently a lot of the coal-fired power plants, particularly in Pakistan, the young coal-fired power plants, have a um, very high debt-to-equity ratio. That means that the, the, the financing is still very heavily dependent on debt. And debt is actually very expensive um, because you have to pay interest rates. So if we can refinance the debt, and um, kind of lower the interest rates, for example, through credit enhancement mechanisms provided by development finance institutions or also um, other uh, institutions, and by having a green component to it, which signals um, to investors that it might be actually cheaper, we can refinance the whole bunch or a significant portion of the existing debt. And if you refinance a lot of the debt, then your financing costs will go down. And so with that kind of, we can, I, I, and we can do that against the promise to retire the coal plants early. Now, what it actually means that we can pay back the debt to the old capital owners, that we can decommission the plant early and that we ideally have a transition assistance um, for workers and anybody else in the community that, that is affected. And really kind of without um, kind of taking a financial hit, we can retire coal plants early if we find the right tools for refinancing. And it's interesting, it's of course more possible for younger plants that have a high um, debt to equity ratio where the debt is still high. In the older plants, um, the debt is already written down. So you need other um, financing mechanisms. So the, the refinancing is also what ASIN um, used. Now, <clears throat> I also want to kind of highlight that of course, Pakistan and many other um, emerging economies still have a rapidly growing need for um, power generation. So it's not just about retiring coal plants, but ideally also um, simultaneously investing in new um, assets for the production of electricity. So solar, wind um, and others. And so in many ways, it, it works quite similar um, that we have a managed transition vehicle, an MTV, um, that um, collects new financing, blended finance. Um, so from credit enhancement, from development finance institutions, maybe a grant from a donor, um, new capital providers, um, and potentially all capital providers that kind of blends the finance together at a ideally lower coal finance, um, at a lower financing cost than the existing coal plant. Again, of course, because of the credit enhancement, because of the grant, and because of the green nature, you have low um, financing costs. And then you operate and retire the coal plant. Let's say you operate it for um, five years, seven years less than the original plant, and you invest the extra money into renewables. Now, <clears throat> that all sounds um, theoretically fine. Um, what we did, we actually calculated what it would be worth. Um, and here are three coal-fired power plants in Pakistan. So SSRL, so 1.3 gigawatt, Engro, um, TAR, 660 megawatt, and Sahiwal, um, Sahi also 1.3 gigawatt. And they're all pretty new. Um, and then we kind of use different scenarios. Um, and I want you kind of to look actually um, really at the lowest number here, kind of that one that is redly circled. And just to give you um, kind of, let's stay with kind of, I would say actually all the way on the left is SSRL 1.3 gigawatts, the business as usual scenario. The enterprise value under the current uh, PPA, really kind of the actual value kind of when you kind of discount all the cash flows is about $2.2 .2 billion. If you manage to do a refinancing, we can increase the value of uh, SSRL to 2.6 billion and we can retire it at the same time eight years early. If we bundle it, 
with renewables um, and a similar PPA like we have for um, the existing coal for, coal fired power plant, we can increase the, the enterprise value to 4.1 billion. So we almost double the enterprise value, and we really kind of looked through the whole um, available data, um, including the real time data. Um, it's it's a very very complex um, financial model. Um, what's really interesting is that the younger the coal plant, um, actually the better the the model usually. Um, so really promising, kind of both just asset portfolio refinancing, just retiring is good. Bundling it with renewables is even better. And here comes an, another idea that we kind of work on, kind of how about if the, particularly since China is so involved, um, can think about a, a debt for renewable swap. And this is really something that I want um, everybody um, kind of to also think about how this could be implemented. Um, China is already in discussion with Egypt for debt for cl um, climate swaps. And how can Pakistan also discuss um, with its Chinese counterparts? And how can kind of really the, the countries come together to address some of the sovereign debt issues um, through such novel um, ideas like debt for renewable swaps? And that could would include then a write down of parts of the sovereign backed loan um, against the commitment from Pakistan for sustainable development. So that means, for example, um, reduction of emissions, renewable energy investments. That would improve. It would reduce the emissions, it would improve the debt sustainability of Pakistan and really improve the business case um, for uh, renewables. There are a couple of things um, that are required for it, including good electricity planning. Christoph, you have about a minute to go. Perfect. The willingness to cooperate, and I think Pakistan and China really through Green CPAC um, are really um, great partners and willing to cooperate. New investors um, that are interested in um, kind of supporting green bond issuances, credit enhancement mechanisms, and the interest to, um, of the relevant parties to actually sell their assets, which is a legally tricky issue. China would also benefit ideally quite a lot from it, particularly also its um, renewable energy um, companies that could sell more of the equipment and ideally also build some um, capacity um, within Pakistan. With that, thank you so much. And um, would be great to have all the questions. Thank you, uh, Christoph. I think that's very insightful. Uh, and we'd like to see that PowerPoint again later, if you can email it, because some of the things are a little small uh, in the graph. I think that uh, it's also important to uh, frame this uh, objective. When we, uh, some of us have spoken of, you have, and I think Mr. Zaberi has talked about coal retirement. And sometimes that gives a, gives a perception that the investment will be dwarfed midway because these are 30 year PPAs, power purchase agreements. So the actually the idea, as we all know, is not to end any project or investment or to uh, renegate on any contract, but to, through mutual dialogue and consent, make a bankable proposal, which actually benefits both the uh, investors and the host country. As you alluded to in your presentation, Christoph, a uh, big problem, which I think a bigger problem is for the, some of the companies rather than Pakistan, that uh, the imported coal payments uh, are not being ma made to the suppliers of the coal, which also had resulted to some of the power plants not being fully active. As a very sub, you know about this issue because the currency given by the state bank is in rupees. But the payment that is to be made to the coal suppliers is in dollars. And then how do you justify the, because our currency has unfortunately been devalued to when the contract was originally signed. So who bears the loss of the, the rupee dollar uh, difference? And of course the company does. So uh, that is actually a very important point that we have to bear in mind. Uh, so <clears throat> I think we have to have uh, China Three Gorges, I think, should take the lead with us here and have a consortium of uh, more Chinese companies. We, I, I have also uh, discussed it with uh, some investors there who are still interested in Pakistan. But uh, the story of the late payments actually sends a 
wrong signal to those investors. You see, because uh, when anyone is investing, they want guarantee on the, the payments, the payback, the IRR. So uh, this is a very important point, but thank you, Christopher, for a very comprehensive presentation. Now I'd like my dear friend, Mr. Zishan Malik Saab, who is going to talk about adapting banking strategies, navigating transition from fossil fuel to renewable amidst CPEC priorities and global shifts. Thank you very much, Mustafa, and thank you, PCI, uh, for giving opportunity. Uh, very interesting forum, I, I must say. Uh, although this is a talk of the town that, you know, you, you have to have all the policies and strategies in place and we can do the transition ASAP. But there are some commercial challenges as well as there are some, some uh, other uh, challenges that we face, not only from the development perspective, but also uh, from the perspective of financing those deals and how to go about it. Uh, I would like to segregate it into two parts. One, the role of the banks as a financier and the role of the bank as a part of the society. So obviously there, there are more than 25 plus commercial banks in Pakistan and with a lot of uh, staff working there, a lot of infrastructure capacities and utilities serving the needs of those banks. Uh, so this was realized in HPL in 20, early 2020 that, you know, we have to do something of us, our own premises, and then we also have to extend the scope to the other uh, clients that we are serving. Um, so under that mechanism, uh, the first thing that was carried out that, you know, out of the 1700 branches, how many we can solarize, how we can make our employees, our utilities and other who can afford and shift to the renewable sources. And also then we extend the scope uh, to the to the clients that we are dealing. So this was decided. And then at the same time, it was decided that we cap the expo year on uh, coal initiatives or the coal fire power projects. So obviously, uh, barring that, uh, that that capacity initiative that we have extended, and we have to take it to a net zero balance by 2030. So this is one other thing that that was done. But at the same time, uh, when we look at the overall initiative, and I echo uh, Mr. Zuberi, uh, Mr. Umar, and now uh, Christoph, that that you know this change obviously going to take a lot of time and energy. Most of the projects in Pakistan that are that have uh, foreign currency to make payment out of pa Pakistan, we are hustling with the foreign uh, reserves. Uh, out of these fossil fuel plants, fifty percent of the fuel is imported. We have indigenous sources and are super critical. We need to have conversion to the local coal so that at least we can survive from that uh, 50%. But at the same time, there is an innate requirement for the base load, as Mr. Zuberi has highlighted, mm -hmm. not only for the uh, uh, domestic users, but also for the, for the commercial users and, and industrial users. Why is it so? Because... Uh, these renewable sources, there are some uncertainty, dependency on the weather, dependency on some other. Uh, for example, in winters, the water flow is lesser. In, in, in summers, it's more. So so we have to see the balance between these two uh, important uh, uh, events. Now, coming to how we can enable the transition. In that, there are a lot of factors that has been taken into account. Uh, green scoops, green bonds, some some things, you know, these are very easy to say, but as Mustafa has said that, you know, until and unless you make it tasteful for the investor, they will not come. And 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 for 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 this part, the role of multilaterals cannot be ignored. Yes. In COP28, uh, uh, we have also participated and in, in, in that actually, the Capacity Building Alliance for Sustainable Inve Investment. This agreement uh, was signed by uh, HPL, and 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 we are actually finding ways that how multilaterals can be, you know, uh, coordinated with the investor that they can come and do the financing in Pakistan for the renewable energy projects. Uh, second accreditation is that we are actually uh, uh, the accreditation process, the Green Climate Fund. Now that is a UN fund that definitely will help uh, uh, flowing of funds from the multilaterals to Pakistan that not only will entertain the request for the renewable energy projects, but also uh, for the transition. But again, 
talking about that in 2030 we can eliminate fossil fuel i think it, it could be a dream but it's not a reality talking about 2050 again i would say that you know it's it's a hard task to do but there are some baby steps that are being taken uh, uh united nations and cpac brf and obviously you know the other organizations where we can take their assistance and we can flow that investment into pakistan by taking into account how we can utilize our indigenous sources, how we can create public-private partnerships, and how we can promote not only as institution, but also role as a, as a, as a member of the society. One thing that Mustafa highlighted, the green bond and green skooks. Uh, initially, when it was being discussed with some Chinese uh, capital market players like CICC and some other, so it was discussed, there was a thorough discussion that how we can uh, uh, actually uh, finance the hydropower projects under Wabda and some other where uh, the utilization could be in renminbi but at this uh, at the, the, that very point the utilization or uh, the requirement was in US dollar so there were again 350 or 360 million dollars was actually divulged from that uh, that cooperation to 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 Wabda uh, but at the same time i think there is a need to do more by having these accreditations and the banks, uh, state bank has recently started that uh, SEMS uh, guidelines and from Pakistan Banking Association, the banks have been nominated who can work on developing those guidelines and some other factors that can be implemented among the banks so that they can assist the renewable projects to, to foster. Uh, one impact that initially uh, has been highlighted that you know the tariff of the renewable yeah please go ahead yeah yeah okay uh, so uh, so i think that uh, the the last thing that i want to share that uh, in september there was a conference with the uh, responsible banking principles on the climate change that has happened in september 2023 and few of the banks of the world have, have signed that agreement and they are, you know, uh, undertaking those guidelines and started implemented these guidelines into the system. Obviously, it's a long journey, but it has been started and the seminars like this will definitely pave the way. Yeah, uh, playing a very uh, pivotal role since the very start of CPEC, actually. And uh, I would now like to request Mr. Sajid Amin, who's uh, the Deputy Executive Director of SDPI, to talk about facilitating low carbon investment. Can you hear me? We, we need to bring in uh, so the central banking, central banks actually they 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 are the major player in this uh, low carbon uh, sector investments, uh, and one of the key area that that's being highlighted is that sort of we we have to de-risk uh, these investments in the green sector in the low carbon markets, uh, right? Particularly for the small investors, and this is where uh, I I thought when Obed talked to me uh, that. Uh, to bring in uh, that we need to engage. Uh, so you can say my my only message for today's discussion is that that we we may need to engage with the State Bank of Pakistan as well. That how can it facilitate uh, the the investments in the green sector in the low carbon sector, low carbon investments. So that that was my uh, key message uh, that I just wanted to uh, keep it on the uh, table uh, for further discussion uh, in this regard. Ji, Dr. Sab? Abad, Sab? Okay. Uh, 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 Madam Shazia Ghani, uh, who has been writing and working on CPEC, and uh, after Madam Shazia, it will be Miss Hong Yu. Uh, Madam Shazia.
Embodiment, please. You ought to be here, but I think what's happening is that the internet is connected. Uh, I'm there connected now. You can speak. Thank you so much, Mustafa. I must say this is excellent dialogue that have been uh, arranged by your institute in collaboration with other partners. And I really enjoyed all the presentation. Christoph did wonderful presentations. Zubairi Saab, you know, he's he has been an uh, old colleague. Uh, we are working on CPEC from last so many years. Uh, he has actually highlighted a couple of points. So first thing first, of course, I'm also in very much favor of renewable energy and green transition. Uh, this is the future. And uh, we need to follow it very diligently. But you know, all the pain points highlighted by Zuberi are they are very much important. Keeping in the overall engaged with China, uh, we are into some guaranteed contracts with the coal power plant. And currently, if you see the uh, Zuberi sub, you know, second me on this, see uh, merit order uh, projects currently being on through the national grid. These coal power plants are you know, producing the cheapest energy uh, developed under the CPEC and simultaneously seeking investment from the same partner, you know, for the alternative or the renewable energy projects. I agree, as Mustafa said, that impression should not be that there would be some kind of disinvestment or, uh, uh, you know, uh, the 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 whole debate should be uh, you know taken uh, to the next level probably in pakistan's more long term engagement with the china on this the ppas we signed in 2015 they would last up to 25 years up to 20 years for certain renewable projects yes there is 100 billion dollars fund that on the third belt and road uh, initiative was made public that there, there would be investments in the energy, uh, green energy, or the environmentally friendly energy project. But You know, we are talk talking about replacing thousands of gigawatt hours electricity produced by these projects. It would not be an easy task. This should, we, we have to, you know, until or unless you understand the whole food chain from the point one to point Z where you want to go ultimately, uh, we should have our discussions in detail, we should plug the numbers to understand what it will take to do that. And simultaneously, we also, I, of course, being public servant, I cannot say, share much of the information, but I do not think this is my personal view that any international financial cooperation under Green Fund is going to, you know, uh, set up a like 500 megawatts renewable project, like 600. So. The four coal power plant we are talking about, they are approximately more than 4,000 megawatts. So replacing 4,000 megawatts by 20 or 30 or 25 megawatt projects, which can be financed through the existing financial frameworks under just energy, under other agree, uh, frameworks, by COP or everything else. We need to really look at you know detail, all, all these details. But of course, as uh, I also believe that future is about sustainable green energy, future is about off-grid solutions, future is about to have a very affordable power. And all these can you know, easily club with uh, uh, the, the ultimate goal of transition towards a more climate-friendly 
uh, energy transition. And I do not need to repeat all those buzzwords here that Pakistan is most affected country by the climate. But we should also remember that despite, you know, putting our case at very big forums and getting it recognized also, ultimately Pakistan was not able to, you know, attract big investment or big, uh, uh, you know, uh, grants or loans or anything like that, that, okay, yes, we acknowledge that you got infected by the climate change. And here is like $5 billion credit line for you to get out of it. So I know the glass of water I'm holding is not drinkable, but I need another glass of water that I can drink so that I can throw it away. So it's really important before throwing that away that how should I want to go about? Maybe medium to long-term targets and then keeping in view the whole horizon of next 30 years and if our policymakers, our think tanks and our scholars can give us some recommendations, it would be probably easy for government of Pakistan to, you know, to uh, chip in. But, you know, any shock-like therapy to just convert most of the coal power plant, like in next two years or three years, probably would not be very easy. But of course, I'm not very much expert into energy. These are some of the observations uh, that I am I'm sharing with the forum for consideration. And I'm also here to learn from you people. Uh, pointed remarks, particularly, and I... I want to in the next uh, dialogue that we have have more a detailed presentation from you uh, on the green financial products that you and i have discussed in the past i think those are very important uh miss uh, uh hongyu who is the senior director in the green innovation hub uh is going to speak on the ex exploring chinese private sector investment potential and uh, also seeing the what are the bottlenecks uh in this green energy transition that we are talking about. Over to you, Hongyu. Mm. Thank you, Mustafa. Thanks for the invitation and uh, greetings from China. Happy Lunar New Year to you all. Uh, I'm Hongyu from Green Innovation Hub. Uh, we are an environmental think tank based, uh, based in Beijing. Uh, founded since 2012, when we were founded, we've been working on climate and energy transition. Uh, as well as green finance and responsible overseas investment of China in developing countries. So it's really a great honor to join today's uh, important discussion because uh, back in 2018, we've been uh, host convening another dialogue with PCI on greening CPAC in Beijing. Uh, and uh, so it's really, uh, I look forward to future opportunities to be in Pakistan and uh, meet you in person and exchange. Uh, and back to the dis uh, discussion, uh, as uh, Musma, uh, Mustafa mentioned, uh, there are uh, already some Chinese, uh, the Chinese investment in the energy sector in Pakistan is really significant. And in the recent years, uh, it's sh uh, sh gradually shifting from coal dominated to uh, renewable energies more. But uh, based, on our, based on our in, uh, previous research on the financing models of China's overseas renewable energies in developing countries in general, we found that there are se several bottlenecks for uh, Chinese financial institutions and renewable energies to uh, invest in developing countries. And uh, uh, one of them is that uh, the, um, how to say, the risk appetite or risk assessment of China's investors regarding renew, uh, developing countries' renewable energy projects sometimes do not reflect the real uh, the, the real uh, risk. Uh, sometimes it overemphasizes the country risk uh, over the project risk. Uh, so it will usually adopt the country ratings uh, to uh, conduct the risk assessment. And for uh, countries such as Pakistan, which have uh, the debt burden, the country rating might uh, influence the overall ratings of the renewable energy projects, which in itself may have better uh, risk assessment result. So one uh, recommendation back then was for the Chinese investors and 
especially the financial institutions and the companies, to uh, reassess the uh, or rebuild their risk assessment uh, indicators or criteria regarding the renewable energies uh, based on the project level. Um, and uh, another is that the Chinese company, the Chinese investment mainly use the uh, the uh, corporate, uh, they seldom use the blended financing or they seldom mobilize the international financing uh, from the MDBs, such as the World Bank or ADB. And they uh, seldom use the, um, the concessional uh, the concessional debt of the multi uh, multilateral development banks, and also uh, when the projects were built, uh, after the project uh, are built uh, during the operation uh, time, Chinese investors seldom engage the other long term investors such as the pension funds or sovereign uh, funds. Uh, unlike the other peer investors from Japan or Korea, so. Uh, so on this front, there are some awareness and capacity building needed for the Chinese investors regarding the um, risk assessment and also on the uh, financing models. But also when we look at the uh, host country, when we look at the partner countries' policies, there are also some room to improve or there are also room for um, uh, to scale up the investment from China to uh, Pakistan. For example, uh, there is a great demand to build up the green finance policies in Pakistan, uh, especially to uh, establish the green taxonomy uh, to define what is the uh, what is green and what is uh, this is the, uh, this does not only apply to the wind and solar power stations. It also applies to the supply chains to the to the to the along the supply chain related to the clean technologies. Uh, if there's a green taxonomy in place, uh, then the uh, investors in Pakistan and also in China, as well as the international investors, could uh, find it easier to identify the green projects, uh, especially the clean technologies. And uh, also, um, in uh, in addition to the green taxonomy, there's also a demand of uh, green taxonomy aligned disclosure, like uh, environmental related information disclosure uh, on the uh, maybe first step is on the green part, but then on the overall climate related environmental information disclosure is also a precondition for uh, international investors, including the Chinese investors, to uh, identify uh, uh, green projects and also project packs and also the, uh, their clients. And uh, just to mention that China, China is strengthening its uh, policy and regulations on taxonomies and on the uh, environmental information disclosure. So there are room for China and 